Here we are again with a show called Comedy Room. The premise is very simple. If you get four or five marvelously funny comedians together and give them a full 60 minutes and just let them talk about comedy, well, probably... Oh, sorry, I dozed off right in the middle of my own uh, idea there. All programs of this general sort, it somehow has been decided, possibly by me many years ago, should have a sidekick. On the old original Tonight Show, I had... Gene Rayburn is my sidekick, and Johnny has Ed McMahon. Many uh, TV hosts have had sidekicks. And we have a wonderful sidekick at this time, ladies and gentlemen, a comedian from England. We thought it would be interesting to get the British point of view to what's funny, because there are so many wonderfully funny English people. Welcome, Mr. Joe Baker. Here he is. <laughs> nice to have you with us. Yes, who are you waving at, Joe? We're not seen in London. No, but there's a man from London here. Oh, really? From Twickenham. Twickenham. Aren't you, sir? Up there, yes. Will you give me a ride home? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Joe, since you are my sidekick, if I may, I'm just going to go, just, just a very quick thing, and here we go. Ah, oh. <laughs> oh, Frank. <laughs> You'll get another chance tomorrow. Anyway, I always kick my sidekicks on the side on the first show. It's a good luck thing. Not too much luck for you, but for me. <laughs> anyway, today we have a room full of comedy giants. As for our first two guests, although they made their mark in two different comedy media, there is a similarity in some of their work. Sid Caesar, it has been said by me, come to think of it, is to the history of television comedy what Charles Chaplin was to film comedy. Seriously, in a class by himself. Welcome, Mr. Sid Caesar. Well, Sid, I realize we're 200 yards apart. <laughs> intimate show, intimate. <laughs> so that's your room. We're going to be working over here for the I'll whole show. Once in a while, we'll talk. You know. Okay. I'll, a man will be by with drinks and some yeah, feminine... I need water. Tell him to bring water. Okay, fine. It's a long way out here. Tell him to bring, bring water! <laughs> it was cold and it stuff. stunk, but of all the drinks I've drunk... I don't remember that one. <laughs> Don't you know Kipling? Don't you, do you like Kipling? I don't know. I've never Kippled is the answer, Donald. <laughs> anyway, Shecky Green, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you. Shecky Green began his career in Chicago 35 years ago, and he's going to end it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, in time, he became a superstar in Las Vegas. In Reno, mm. <laughs> But seriously, in Vegas, a, a habit developed that any entertainer, any of us appearing in town, would always go to see Shecky's act with very good reason. He's the champ at that. Welcome, Mr. Shecky Green. Yes, You know, you're not wrong about Reno, you know that. And I was joking. Never did make it in Reno. Are you serious? Nope. <laughs> you're one not the, serious. One of the reasons why is I never played Reno. Maybe ah. <laughs> I have never told you guys this in tandem. Have you, I don't know if you've ever been, been in tandem before. I was once in tandem. Yeah. yeah. I was in tandem in England. Ta I, was, I, was, I was in tandem in New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. You know, an interesting thing, I... <laughs> don't get excited, don't get excited. Now, will those of you take a close-up of Shecky again, please, and do that again. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. I don't know people don't know that. Now, people over 50 in the audience are doubled up laughing, and 17-year-old people are saying, why is that funny? You were imitating, I mean, you know, that a man named Hugh Herbert, a That's wonderful right. character comedian. See the audience going, yeah. Now you know. Now you know. But the kids don't know from Hugh Herbert, do they? No, it's a strange thing about it. There's a lot of impressions uh, that I do, even in my act, and uh, these people are dead now. And uh, little by little, my act is dying off. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, we were going to announce this to later in the show, but all of us on this program passed away some time ago. <laughs> but due to tape, 
This is why we preserved ourselves. <laughs> well, I gotta, I gotta, I'll give, give you another one. I'll bet nobody knows. All right, who? Okay, just see if you can guess who. It was a woman, a little woman, a little Russian woman. She used to be in all the Wolfman pictures. I know who. I would like very much Maria for you Aspen. to... That's right, Maria Ospenskaya. My son, there is something I was never going to tell you. When you were three years old, you were bitten by the werewolf. <laughs> that doesn't bother me, but don't come in the house. There is wolf things all over the furniture. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now then. That's a wolf thing. I mean, that's true. What could be? <laughs> can be. be wolf, wolf can have a lot of things. <laughs> right? Wolf hair is all over wolf the furniture. Wolf hair. Look at those. A wolf mane. A wolf wolf. <laughs> What I started to tell you, yes. lo, these many seconds ago, is that you two, now come on, now sit yes. up straight. You two jerks, if I may say so, <laughs> happen to be, in my opinion, and why do I have my hands at my own throat when I, I say know. this, two of the funniest men in the world. Rob <laughs> I got to tell you, but Sid and I belong to the same gymnasium. We go to a place gymnasium. Gymnasium. Yes. Is it, isn't that it? Yes. <laughs> I tie the up as we go along. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> and, and that's and you get more salt coming out later on with bigger words. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I get Reader's Digest every month. I learn you know twenty words a month. This month I've learned words like maudlin, innocuous, and inane. But it's very hard to sneak in a conversation. People say, hi, Shank, how do you feel? I'm kind of maudlin, innocuous. And... <laughs> You're kind of an idiot, too, aren't you, kid? I don't know. We didn't have that word. We go to the same gym, he and I. I must say, for your age, whatever it might be, you both look terrific. You look terrific no, but, for any age. But let me tell you, we, we both do the same exercise. Now, you button your coat. I just want to show you. We both work out. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Look how nice and easy. I want to show you what the situation with me. Now, some people can exercise and some people can't. <laughs> Well, you're exercising the wrong area. What? What? This West is Hollywood. Exercise. He eats a Oh, he eats too much. While I'm, while, while I'm exercising, I do that. While he's exercising, when he stops exercising, then he goes with yeah. both hands. His bicep from bringing up the food is very strong. Yeah. If you'll but he, he is in such shape. I cannot tell you. Oh yeah. I got myself in shape. Then why is my index finger up in the air? I don't know. <laughs> Jan Murray <laughs> told me a story one time that as you and Jan and apparently some others were coming out of a studio in New York. Uh, a man on the sidewalk said something, it, it, a terrible thing to say, I'll just put it that way, and that you actually grabbed the man by his jacket and held him up in the air against the wall for a few moments and thought it over. Is that a true story? Yes. Then I'll be running along. Because <laughs> I'm going to be very mean to you tonight. I don't want to get lifted That's up in right. the air. No, no, no. No, I stopped all that. I really did. Because it's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't pay off. It's no good. I mean, I stopped everything else. I've turned my whole life around. Really? 190 degrees, not 180. No. All because, right. No, that's 180. Turn around I'm around. sorry. <laughs> I was turned the wrong way. I had a reputation of, of being a hitter also, and I never was. I never had I, 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 I But could you, be... you have been in fights. Yes. Yes. I just, matter of fact, just before I got on, I said, sure. <laughs> I'll I, I tell you the truth, I was, I, 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 I'll be all right. <laughs> I was told that you once got in a fight with one of the Fischetti brothers. Is well, this a true story? Yeah, because he's not around anymore, so I can tell the story. Yes, yeah. really, I, he was a Chicago Mafia hoodlum, right? Well, uh, is it all right to say that? I just did. Oh, good. Yeah. Both of us coming from Chicago, we can say that. Sure. Totally. But uh, it was when I was working with Frank Sinatra. Excuse mm -hmm. me. And, uh... <laughs> Frank, don't, don't take that person. I was testing the carpet. It's nice and soft. Matter of fact, Frank Sinatra once saved my life. You know. How was that? Five guys were beating me up outside of the hotel, and I heard Frank say, that's enough. <laughs> now, we, uh... <laughs> but I, I, uh, I was walking into the hotel of the Fountain Blue in Miami Beach, Florida. You were walking into the hotel when, walk... the, when the Fountain Blue? In the, in the, in the, in the, oh, in the Fountain when, Blue hotel. When the, found, when the Fountain Blue, then I was walking in the, and I couldn't, you didn't. Will you please translate? I was telling him, please, but Andre Fisch was Andre Van in the Fountain Blue. <laughs> <laughs> How did they say so? I, I don't know what color it was anyway, you know. Yeah, what was the image like? So now I was walking in there, and there was five guys that grabbed me, and Fischetti was one of the guys that grabbed me, yeah. you know, and they were the, the tattooing my head with a blackjack. Seriously? Seriously. Yeah. And uh, 
because I was much better looking than this before. <laughs> and uh, but I still got the dimple. You see the dimple? Yeah. yeah. I used to have an aunt come on every Sunday and say, how's the mother, how's the father? <laughs> I had a midget uncle with the same habit. He was bad. Anyway, I got to tell you. Oh, anyway, I walked in and these five guys actually grabbed me and they started beating me up and everything else. And I, I finally broke loose and I got the machete, you know, and I, I split his nose and his eye and everything. Mm -hmm. And after the thing was over, he came, he said, I want to talk to you. I really mean this. And also said, don't tell the guys in Chicago about this. You know what I mean? <laughs> I beg you, don't tell the guys in Chicago. I don't know who that guy was talking about. The guys in Chicago. I said, no, I won't tell the guys in Chicago about this. No. He said, okay, we're pals again. And then we hugged, we embraced, and everything else. And uh, that was it. But so we've established that you two gentlemen are physically formidable characters. And, but that's all behind you. No, we're going to try it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one left. i got to win it. So. Anyway, no, that, that's behind that. you, you say, Sid. Yes, I'm uh, concentrating on comedy now. Oh, yes. And I became a saint. <laughs> I go with Russian. I don't defect. I want Russian direct. <laughs> you guys both do dialect comedy. When did you start? That has to start in childhood. You hear it in your neighborhood, right? Right, yeah. Well, I, was, uh, I, when I, I was a musician was, uh, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I used to play with, uh, with three Italians and two Jews. Th in the same band? The same band. I see. It was a five-piece band. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was Mike Cipicello, uh, Tony Cacciatore, and... Uh, Chicken, chicken cacciatore? No, Tony cacciatore. Oh, I see. <laughs> and I used to go over to their house, you know, for... Uh, for for chicken cacciatore? No, the first... Uh, on Sunday. You have Sunday dinner. It starts at 3.30. Mm -hmm. And the old man used to sit there. Yeah. That, was, that was the nice of food. I'm, I used to, when they put food on the table when I was a kid, you know, you ate it. Yeah. And then that was gone, and they put another plate on. And this is, you heard was, this and you picked it up, huh? Yeah, well, I heard that, but I'm talking about the food. We don't care about the food. All right. <laughs> so I used to listen to all these, uh, all these dialects. Well, my father had a restaurant in yeah. uh, Yonkers, New York. Your father ran a restaurant? No, he owned a restaurant. He owned a restaurant. He owned a restaurant for 60 years. 60? Mm -hmm. 60. 60 years. How old was he at the time? Uh... <laughs> He must have been in his, uh... You want me to do what I did to Fischetti? You want me to get him? No, no, no. I mean, any time you leave me, kid. It was the Velazón del Casu. 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 I'll tell you, we will set matters Italian aside for just a moment. Un momento. Un momento. Yes, a little momento. A little momento. Because your classic dialect that most of your television viewers know you for and love you for is the famous German professor with the black hat and the frock coat and all that. So we happen to have a little clip of ah. that. And if I may, we're going to run it now. It's Carl Reiner interviewing yes. the inquiring reporter. And uh, to me, no matter what you ever said in response to his questions, was I was always on the floor. I never laughed. I just got down on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up like this and said, that guy's terrific. Okay, Terry, roll the, uh, the German professor. If, if One so time I had the most wonderful time in my whole, my whole life. I never have thought... But it was the time I, I spoke with this mermaid. It was wonderful. A mermaid, Professor? Yes, she was gorgeous. I'm telling you, and she was intelligent. And you, you, mean, you actually, you imagine you actually saw a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> Who was imagining? Well, I said I saw a mermaid. Well, we all know, Professor. That we all know. The <laughs> <mermaid. What's that? laughs> Legendary and mythical. We all know that the sailors have conjured up this myth. Look, I told you I saw a mermaid, and that's it. Well, I, I, I don't like to dispute you, but you want to step outside. <laughs> You understand? I think that mermaids are probably just legendary. I, I never... You know what I'm going to do with you? I'm going to show you up. You want to see a picture? You want to see a picture? Well, I... Uh... I I'll, I'll show you a picture, all right? I don't believe that. I'll show you a picture. Right away. <laughs> and you'll be embarrassed, boy. Boy, will you be embarrassed. Don't have to. Don't, no, don't, no, don't, don't worry about it. Boy, will you be embarrassed. Maybe, 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 Maybe you left it in your other suit, Professor. What right other suit? This is it, kid. <laughs> Boy, you're going to be embarrassed right away. I'll show you a picture. Right? If somebody's going to be embarrassed right away. I'll show you a picture. Here. Here, right here. There. How's that? Well, that's a picture of you, Professor. But well, where's the mermaid? The mermaid snapped the picture. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, 
about you, but to me it's blue. <laughs> Professor, now there's... A... I'm not one of those cops. Professor, there's, there's a question I'd like to ask you. Now, now the ichthyologists claim, and I, I read this in a book lately, the ichthyologists claim that in all the aquamarinal life, both substratana and substratina, from the plankton to the vertebrae, there is a marked comparison between the mobility and gill structure of all self-propelled crustacea. Now, is this basically true, Professor? <laughs> I'd like to put on two different pairs of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, it's obviously a, a foolhardy exercise to try to cover the entire lives and careers of four of America's funniest men in, in 60 minutes. For those of you who want to know more about Sid Caesar and who doesn't, he's written a fascinating book called Where Have I Been? Sounds like a funny title, funny picture, but it's quite a remarkable book about the, uh, the good news and the bad news of being a comedian, so to speak. Fascinating book. Now, our next guest uh, does not use accents or physical comedy. Uh, he works in an entirely different way, to social, political commentary, political humor. His props consist of a newspaper, and his wardrobe consists of a sweater. Also some pants and shoes, so it shouldn't be a total loss. Welcome to our comedy room, a fellow that's been called the thinking man's comedian, Mort Saul. Great to see you, partner. Every 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> Mort, you and Shecky started out in Chicago uh, in the early 1950s, uh, became big, you were just about the same time. You remember the, uh, your first appearance with us on the old Tonight Show? Yeah, very well. Uh, there were no laughs in, through the entire monologue. Really? The audience started to laugh at the end. No kidding. They didn't laugh at the beginning. They, were, uh, they hadn't heard, it was a strange face with strange ideas and a strange dialect. Yeah, new kind of comedy. That. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I was working at a club called the Blue Angel with Jonathan Winters, mm -hmm. and uh, we knew you'd put on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> anybody was funny. <laughs> and, uh, and we came over there, and uh, there were always a lot of uh, newer guys like ourselves in comedy and a lot of jazz guys on the show, too. Yeah. And, uh, but the jokes that nobody was laughing at were jokes like... Uh, Can you remember the material now? Oh, yeah. I'm uh, still using the material. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm the leaving it to Reagan now. No, the one of the jokes was, um, it was during the Eisenhower administration, and the Cold War was on. One of the jokes was, uh, every time the Russians throw an American in jail, Nixon throws an American in jail to show them they can't get away with it. There was no left, right? It's a great then it was, um, they took away Dr. Oppenheimer's Q clearance to work on, on the H-bomb. Uh, right. And the FBI arrives at the University of California in his lab and they say to him, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, turning your brain, you're through. Nobody <laughs> laughed. And it was like that. It was like that. It was highly uh, yeah. politicized for its time. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and nobody was laughing. It's interesting. We can, see now, we can see now that those are not just okay jokes. They're superior jokes. But I think the reason, I'd forgotten, I'll take your word for it, that you didn't get many laughs. The reason often is that uh, whether it's a musician, a tap dancer, a painter, a sculptor, a comedian, if you're doing something radically new, the people just take a while to understand what you're doing before they can say that's good painting or good comedy or whatever. Well, how true it is, you know, Mort and I were in uh, Chicago at the same time. I was, I was working the Chez Prix with Ant Southern. It was my first really big engagement. And Mort was working in a place called the Black Orchid. Mm -hmm. And the guy that owned the club, Al Greenfield, uh, wanted to fire him because he wouldn't put on a suit. Because Mort wouldn't wear a suit? He wouldn't wear a suit. Now, at that time, he wore, it was, you know, as soon as he worked in a nightclub, he had to wear a tuxedo. Mm -hmm. That was it. That's what they thought. They didn't know about the material or anything, these guys. Just hey, you got to get a suit, you know what I mean? I couldn't come into the club. I had to go out in the street through the kitchen. Seriously? And come to the stage. Couldn't go through the club. Jeez. I think it, he did fire you, though, didn't he? Yeah, he fired me. I didn't finish the engagement. And uh, it was my first trip away from the Hungry Eye. And Shecky kind of adopted me. Ah. And he took me to the Chez Paris to get me to be well-known on the Jack Eigen show. Mm -hmm. And I walked in, and he used to have a disc jockey there in the, in the uh, lounge of the, of the club with this busty blonde next to him. And people would call in questions to this maven. And mm -hmm. as Shecky and I walked in, this uh, girl was there, and she said, Jack, a listener wants to know what you think of Joseph Stalin. And <laughs> Jack said, Stalin knows what I think of him. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that is, that is where Mike Nichols and Elaine May got the idea for one of their early classics, the 
quote, dumb, end quote. I'm not putting Eichen down personally, but that's what they thought. The, the kind of, uh, you know, jerky disc jockey and the woman who's not too bright helping him out. One of their early great bits. He turned to me, Eigen, and Shecky was there, you know, holding me up, moral support. And Eigen said to me, uh, he said, uh, you nonconformists are not going to turn our business upside down. I said, you know, who are the others? And he said, Marlon Brando with his undershirt, 54. And he said, uh, he said uh, even if you're successful, and I doubt it, you're not going to have any friends. Ah. So uh, I said, Albert Einstein said that uh, I shall live in that, uh, in that solitude, which is painful ad adolescence, but delicious in maturity. Mm. And Jack Eigen said, yeah? Well, Sophie Tucker said life is nothing without <laughs> friends. <laughs> Each, you know, we'd each appeal to a higher authority. Right. <laughs> Let's go home. Jeez, that's wild. Well, Sophie Tucker said that's Talking beautiful. Jack yes, Sid. Uh, I was one, uh, the first nightclub I ever worked. I was never in a nightclub in my life. The first one I was in was the Copacabana, which I worked, and I knew nothing about nightclubs. And uh, Jack Eigen, as you said, was, uh, was, was, was had the broadcast, and I was nervous in the week. I was like, radio, radio. I mean, kind of it was really, and I sat down and. Charles Lawton was coming in, and, mm. and uh, Jack Eigen said, Hey, uh, Charlie, Charlie, why don't you come over here? Real Charles Lawton. Charlie, why don't you come over here? Join us. Good. And Charles Lawton sat down and says, sat right next to him and said, Why don't you call me Chucky? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We have uh, little bits of tape and film from time to time. because We told the guys they didn't have to perform. They can if they want to, but they can just relax, too. But, Chucky, we looked through our old tape files and found something that to the best of my recollection, I wrote about 1961, and you and I did it. At the time, there was a guy, remember more, a guy named Steve Nagy, who used to describe what was happening in bowling matches, and he was always whispering. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he was always... He, he didn't want to disturb the bowlers. He's always saying, this is Steve Nagy. He now has his index finger in the wrong hole, and consequently, don't <laughs> when he lets the ball go, he's going to hurt himself, or whatever. <laughs> and I used to wonder, who's this jerk that was whispering? You know? So anyway, I, I did a kind of a Steve Nagy voice, on because the people at, at big golf tournaments, they do the same thing. It's a million dollars riding on one putt. And there's a guy talking like there's this. There's a guy talking like this right behind you. So that, do we have the, uh, the cassette? Okay, anyway, this, this is <laughs> Shecky. Uh, playing the golfer and I'm doing the the voice announcer who's talking a little too loud on the green at a crucial moment. Let's see how it turns out. We're at the <laughs> quiet, please. We're at the 18th green at the Desert Lodge Country Club. Excitement's at its peak here in this $100,000 tournament. I'm speaking as quietly as I can. The man you see having just approached the green right now is the uh, professional golf's leading money winner, Arnold Duffer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He's about to attempt a putt. Short putt means $50,000 in first prize money for Arnold. His opponent's ball, as you can see, is only a few inches from the cup. Should Arnold miss his putt, Arnold's opponent will win for sure. But as everyone knows, Arnold Duffer is always calm, never gets rattled. Arnold is now looking over the putt. The putt looks quite easy, but what Arnold doesn't know is there's a strong wind coming in from the east. <laughs> yes, Arnold has the uh, putter now in his left hand. He's about to bring his right hand back in the shaft, his favorite grip, but for a shot like this, most pros put the hands a little lower on the club. <laughs> and this is, uh, that's right. Some even recommend putting cross-handed with the left hand below the right hand, tapping the ball with a short backhand stroke. And uh, this is Steve Nagy, just in from the bowling alley, telling you that Arnold now has his feet a little closer together. I was just speaking to some of the pros in the locker room. They feel a wider stance is better. Feet are too close together, in the opinion of some of the bystanders here this afternoon. And uh, some would even recommend a little bit wider, a little bit farther apart. Uh, uh, some people feel that a cross-legged position with the back to the cup uh, gives a certain kind of control, blocks the wind from that particular direction. And... Uh, enables the man to concentrate hitting the ball under his armpit right into the cup in a short distance. Arnold is ready to putt now. Remember, if he misses this putt, ladies and gentlemen, his opponent will win the tournament for certain. Be very quiet, please. Uh, that's it, Arnold. He's all set now. Putt it nice and hard, Arnold. And here he goes. <laughs> Here 
here comes his lucky opponent. It looks now as if he is sure to win the $150,000. You mean to tell me I was funny once? Yeah. <laughs> I hardly remember that, do you? No, not at all. Yeah, I can hardly remember it. I mean, I see us and maybe some little glimmer, but basically I don't recall that. Weird. Well, <laughs> Mort, yes. to jump back to you, Woody yeah. Allen, certainly a high authority on the subject of funniness, he has said of you that you restructured the joke as we know it. Uh, do you know exactly what he meant by that? He, uh, uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know. He, he used to, he took a lot of nutrition from, uh, I mean, spiritually, from the idea that you could go your own way and you could mm -hmm. still work. Yeah. used to come and watch the show. He, uh, he very generously says in a book by uh, Eric Lax, his uh, biography, mm -hmm. that I changed his life. Recently, I was in New York working, and uh, he came in to see the show, and he was very depressed. Really? So he had a lot of anxiety. He's in this endless therapy, and he felt that the audience was fickle, and that a lot of his audience had evaporated as he became a more serious filmmaker. They'd run off with Dudley Moore. Mm. And uh, I said, geez, is there anything I can do? You know, it's a shame that success is so hollow. And he said, could you change my life back? Ah. You know, so, uh, of course, I don't have that power. No one does. Yeah. But, another, <laughs> another reason for his uh, early uh, announced public appreciation of you has occurred to me. I remember when you first showed up, first of all, I loved you and I loved your humor. That's why every time you were in town, I was honored to have you on the show, needless to say. But it also struck me that you were in the context of what, as Shecky was saying earlier, comedians had traditionally been like Bob Hope, Milton Berle, uh, Lou Holtz guys with tuxedos and kind of an authoritative vaudeville manner. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Wonderful to be here. And I just want to say, you know, that old-fashioned comedy approach, you were in that context, quote, unprofessional. You were also brilliant, but you know what I mean by that. You didn't oh, seem yeah, like... Oh, yeah, quite so. You didn't seem like a performer. Uh, you were a great performer, but because it was new, it seemed unprofessional. And that's the thing that first struck me when Woody was new in the business, and he tells this about himself. The first few appearances he made, he got no laughs because he, too, seemed like no performer at all. And finally, they realized what a brilliant performer he was. Well, uh, what do you used to write? Uh, For you? Yes. Woody Allen. And Woody wrote, uh, I think, I worked with uh, Woody Moss with Larry Gelbart. And I never saw a shyer guy, because when I, went, I, I never knew him before, and Larry mm -hmm. brought him in, uh, Larry Gelbart, and uh, we sat and he said, hello, how are you? And he was very, very shy. Until I, you know, I said, don't you, uh, you about girls and do things and talk about that, you know? He said, yeah, but I don't, uh, I don't talk about girls. I don't, uh, I said, well, make yourself, you know, that you're a great lover. Play against it. Mm. And that was it. Mort, you've uh, done material on, I think, six or seven American presidents. Is there any one of them that was your, your easiest target? Yeah, I suppose Nixon. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't lay a glove on Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, very difficult. And he has his own humor. Mm -hmm. That kind of, he has that kind of, it's sort of a commercial humor. It's sort of holiday in. Uh, kind of country club humor. After <laughs> dinner. Uh, yeah. His humor, I'll give you an example of his humor, instead of being so clinical. Um, I was at the White House. Gee, yeah. I write for Reagan, too. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he was, uh, he, uh, he said to me, he asked me when I got the invitation to the White House, and I said, three weeks before I got there, and he said to me, do you think a letter should take three weeks to cross America? He said, what do you think of the post office? So I said, uh, are you going to fire everybody in the postal service? And he said to me, uh, no, I'm going to keep them on, but I'm going to mail them their checks. Ah. <laughs> That's just a funny line. Yeah. Uh, you also were, unlike many of the rest of us who have worked in traditional nightclubs or radio and TV and so forth for the most part, you've also worked a lot in colleges. Yeah. Uh, have college audiences changed over the last 20 years or so? I don't know. I don't go that much anymore, but they're... Uh, I suppose until they start drafting them and sending them to El Salvador, mm -hmm. they're all going to be uh, content to be uh, doctors, lawyers, and uh, what, pharmacists? I don't know where the joke is there, but that, that's, um, I don't, th I think it's latent virtue. People mm -hmm. are only as good as they have to be. Ah. And uh, there's nowhere for them, uh, I don't know, I just think the audience now is sharper than the comedians. Hmm. I think the humor is in folklore. Could be. The audience is very sharp. Mm -hmm. The audience always has something to say. The funny, uh, the funny joke is going around about Pia Zadora. I never heard from a comedian. Yeah. That's a whole new subject. Who is it that creates, who writes, makes up the funny stories that we hear all day? I don't mean the one-liners or the crazy lines we do in sketches, but the ones about, you know, three Armenians got off a streetcar in yeah, St. Peter's. Yeah, folklore jokes. Yeah. Nobody, jokes. Nobody's ever known who creates them. No. I've asked every comedy writer in the business, have you personally ever written the one about... Uh, 
uh, a rabbi, a priest, and a Jew went to heaven, and St. Peter said, they all said, no, never, never anything like it. And yet we hear hundreds of them every year. Weird. You hear them every week. They yeah. keep on coming. Sure. Did Pia's you hear the Pia Sidora joke? Which one was that, Joe? <laughs> and she wanted to be a real actress, so her old man, who's got a few bob, you know, a few bucks, he said, what would you like to do? So I want to do a straight play. And he said, what? She said, well, I've read this book. It's called The Diary of Anne Frank. Yeah. So he said, right, we'll get a theatre. So he bought the theatre. Trillions, he bought it, you know, got the best director. <laughs> Away they went. <clears throat> they went down there, and she went on for the opening night. She was terrible, really, apparently, supposedly. In called. the story? Yeah, in the story. It's a joke, of course, you know. Ginsburg, Ginsburg, and Ginsburg. And um, <laughs> she went on over the first half, and then the part where the stormtroopers come in, the audience, somebody at the back shouted out, She's in the attic! <laughs> That's the story. That's the story. That's the story. Mort, we mentioned earlier that in contrast to Shecky, in contrast to Shecky and Sid Caesar, Bit late. Or, or Frank Cap, our drummer, <coughs> uh, you don't do dialects, you don't do impressions, but we have uh, tangible evidence, which is the best kind, I suppose that you once did an impression of a performer, and we found this out in consulting our computerized records the other day, and the guys, uh, Terry, has uh, racked up in the booth uh, a, a thing from one of our old shows, the old Sunday Night Comedy series, of you working, in a sense, as an impressionist. And it's interesting, you, as you guys know, sometimes you go for voices, Rich Little does very precise voices, Frank Gorshin, but in, in Mort's case, he went for the, the way the, the target of his uh, physical satire dressed, uh, things about his tie, his wardrobe, and so forth. Anyway, if we have that film, let's uh, show Mort in his one uh, uh, instance as an impression. And here he is, Steve Allen. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Uh, good evening. Good evening, and uh, welcome to another show for Plymouth. But uh, first, I'd like to recommend this book to you. <laughs> you can't be a better person while watching this show. I just read this on the way here from my dressing room. And I think every American should read this book. It's called, Is Your Fallout Shelter Termite Proof? <laughs> Enjoy that. Now, I think we should uh, get the show started here with a little music by one of my... Favorite composers, me. <laughs> I have uh, some music here I'd like to play, a number from my 958th record album, which is called Steve Allen's 958th record album. <laughs> Feeling basically that although I may never sell a million records, I may make a million records. <laughs> so I think uh, here's the song, just as I recorded it. And uh, while I'm listening to my music here, there's a little music, and I have my music. There we are. Why don't you, uh, why don't you listen to this message from Pete Hansen? Uh, <laughs> we rehearsed that, and you were out of the studio. Uh -huh. We waited until you vanished, and yeah. so you'd subsidize your own overthrow. <laughs> It was actually very, very apt. You, you don't realize what mannerisms you have until somebody does you in that sense. You? <laughs> we have uh, another uh, guest that we're bringing out now to add to our group. Uh, we had the pleasure of uh, working with Bill Maher on the other six shows called Music Room, which we've done for the Disney Channel folks. And uh, he's doing very well in the business. He's in the, the new young comedian category. He is new, he is young, and he's certainly a comedian, very funny man. On The Tonight Show, he was recently singled out on the anniversary show as one of the three brightest uh, new comics in the business. Welcome once again our friend Bill Maher. Here he is. Thank you very much. What a night. Or if cable, maybe what a day. How are you? <laughs> you never know anymore. How are you? You're pretty good? We, uh, I should tell you... <laughs> <laughs> I should tell you a little about myself. I'm not as renowned as uh, these colleagues here. I am uh, not originally from California. I'm from Earth. And uh, <laughs> I'm out here to uh, apply my trade. I like it out here. It's a little trendy, don't you think? I, uh, women always here tell me, uh, you never try anything new. I always get that you never do anything new here, which is true, I don't. I like meatloaf. 
I don't have to try. I had sushi. They dragged me. You ever have that raw fish? <laughs> Good if you like bait. <laughs> I said to the waiter, I said, this isn't the food we eat, is it? I said, this is food to get other food with. <laughs> Here in America, we don't eat the first slimy thing that crawls up on our plate. Worst cooking. Well, actually, my mother's cooking was pretty bad. Uh, Jewish cooking, my mother's Jewish, can be kind of uh, <laughs> matzah. Do you ever have that flat pieces of cardboard? And, of course, the Jewish answer everything tradition. I say, Ma, why do we eat like this? She said, tradition. This is the way we ate when the Egyptians were chasing us. <laughs> I said, it's been 5,000 years. Let the bread rise. For I don't see the pharaoh on our tail here. I... Cockroaches in our kitchen were going, no, I'm going to grab something on the way home. We adopted a refugee family. They went, no, I'm good. <laughs> That's something last year. I hate to feel bloated. <laughs> I kid my mother and father. They, um, my mother is Jewish. My father is Catholic. I come from what they call a, a mixed marriage. That's the truth. I was uh, raised Catholic formally with the Jewish mind. It's true. For example, we used to uh, go into confession, and I would bring a lawyer in with me. <laughs> Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I think you know Mr. Cohen. <laughs> I kid my parents. They, um, no, they are actually ethnic. They're, <laughs> they're immigrants to this country, and it has always been my one wish to make enough money to someday send them back behind the Iron Curtain. <laughs> Call me sentimental, if you will. No, they live in uh, New Jersey now. They, they came over to New York, and then like a lot of parents in my parents' generation did, they moved to the suburbs. For us, the kids, they tell you to make your life easier. And then during my life, do nothing but give me grief for having an easy life. I said, Dad, I would have gone to Vietnam, but I had Little League. <laughs> said mentality, you know. We, my, they got through the Depression, God bless them for that, but did we have to always eat everything? We could waste no food. My father would walk into the kitchen, he'd go, Oh, you know, the black banana's the best one. I go, okay, you eat it. There's a straw, it's a little mushy. It's... There's always the depression, you know, whenever we'd complain, he's like, yeah, the depression. And I was a kid, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was five years old. He'd go, you know, in the 30s, the whole country was in a depression. And I'd think, wow, a whole country staying in bed watching TV all day. <laughs> Picture other countries coming by to cheer us up. I don't know, shaming us out of it. What are you depressed about? You're an attractive country. You're well liked around the world. I love that joke. <laughs> That's the great thing about America. People can differ. Government, of course, doesn't use that term now. They use depression. That's out. They use recession because it sounds better. <laughs> sounds like recess. <laughs> People aren't out of work. They're just playing kickball. I kid former President Reagan. And I think if he were alive today, that he'd be doing a heck of a job. Well, he's, he's alive. I, I don't trust George Bush on that score, though. It's got to be tempting to be a heartbeat away from a man that old. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Bush goes around the White House trying to scare him. <laughs> <laughs> I voted for uh, John Anderson last time out, who I see is now making keys in Woolworth. So that's, <laughs> that's where new ideas will get you, ladies and gentlemen. But at least this is America where we have the choice. Isn't that right? We decide which clowns run the circus over here. And I, I can see you're very excited about it. That, that's what cable TV is. You know, you have a choice now. Nice to be on a family entertainment network here. You know, there's a lot of stations now, cable stations, that offer nothing but smut all the time. And I'll tell you, these stations that do that, they don't make us better people. They don't increase our knowledge of humanity. And they don't come in clearly enough where I live. <laughs> I, I have to go to a bar to see it. And you know how tough it is. Do you know why men go to bars? you know why mating takes place in bars? It is because of the alcohol. Because a man has to get a woman close to a state of unconsciousness before what he says even begins to make sense. That's why before the invention of alcohol, primitive men had to actually club women over the head. A guy would go into a singles cave. What they had... And he would literally hit on a woman. That's where the phrase to hit on came from. He would actually pick her up. That's why they called it a club to begin with. But enough of that. Very, <laughs> thank you. The master of segues. <clears throat> it's true, it's very difficult for, uh, for men, you know, because it's a wealthy country. Just to impress a girl, you've got to have nice clothes, 
A job helps. Cars, you know. The thing, the secret, man, is to go to one of your poorer countries. <laughs> go to Angola. <laughs> you can impress a girl with things like, yeah, I got shoes. <laughs> Not easy being single, or being married, or having kids, or any of it. Now, I always think about naming kids, because I never, I never liked my name. And there's that old joke about the, the Chinese, so I'm sure they all know it, about they drop silverware to name the kids. Ping Ching Wang, remember that? Old joke? <laughs> Apparently still a good joke. <clears throat> I always think about, you ever meet Swedish people? They have very guttural names. Sven! You ever meet them very, you know, the Swedish Nordic types? Which I find out what it is, it's a cultural thing. It's Swedish mothers give the name of the child as they're giving birth. It's during the Ola! <laughs> Bjornborg! That's the name of the child. Sometimes it's an easy bird. Uskadu. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Oh, very good. Very good. Good one. <laughs> good one. Like I'm running for something. <laughs> That's the hard. toughest thing in the world to do, is to stand up there and do that. Oh, sure. That's one right. thing I like about you... The way I do it, is it? You were, <laughs> are you really relaxed, or did you, are you just like Jack Benny, who was often nervous, but seemed relaxed? I am Jack Benny. <laughs> <laughs> but you are relaxed, are you? Yes. Uh, I mean, that comes... That's what uh, comes... The only thing I'm suited to do. Sure. I'm did, very nervous around the house. Did working... <laughs> Been working in front of these three giants and, and Joe Baker, great English comedian, did that uh, make you a little uneasy? I love new faces, Steve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, gi giants? Giants, yeah. Titans of the industry. Um, Somebody once told me, speaking of uh, nervous performers and those who are not, that Red Skelton, certainly one of the powerful comedians of the century, is so nervous before every performance for the last 60 years that he sometimes yes. tosses his cookie. <laughs> are, are you, are you, uh, Sid, yeah. are you nervous before you go on? Yes. Really? Yes. Every time. And, uh, I remember I used to be very superstitious. I used to knock wood and, you know, tear down and hit people and everything. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to rob it, I could go. <laughs> I would, uh, I really was very, I, I remember the first time I was on Broadway, and we were opening in, uh, New Haven, and I had this number, five dollar number. Hello, baby, you better get ready and come down and get my stick. Good town, baby, rock it. Well, Zion got five dollars. He's going to hold my pocket. Real tight. 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 Real and I had, and I started off and like, go, hello, baby, you better get ready, come down and get my study. And then all of a sudden the cotton came in and went, get a bit of chicken. Boy, that, you try to work that? With cotton. Work with cotton. Ah. That's nervous. As long as I have you rolling, it occurs to me, Terry, this might be an interesting uh, place to uh, pr rack up that next little uh, piece of videotape of SIDS. We don't have time to show the whole sketch. It's a thing I wrote for you and me to do. I'd wanted for some time to do a takeoff on the 60-minute show, and we don't have time for the whole thing. But more, the 60-minute show always has seemed to me a show that is in number one position because the American people are fascinated at seeing close-ups of capitalists lying. <laughs> and I, I say this as a capitalist myself. I'm a businessman. Hooray for capital. I'm not putting it yeah, down. Yeah. But some capitalists are crooks. Some Catholics are crooks. Some communists are crooks. Every group has its crooks. You know. And Mike Wallace has a way of pinning them right to the wall. So in this, I'm like a Mike Wallace character. And Sid is your typical dishonest whatever. You know, he's got 19 rackets going. And this is something in the middle of the sketch where I'm really trying to pin him to the wall and expose him for the cheat and the fraud and the criminal he is. Let's see what it looked like. Wait a minute. Now, we'll settle this one. All oh, right, let's settle it. Can you look me straight in the eye and deny these accusations? Of course. Straight I'll look you straight in the eye. Straight in the eye? And deny every accusation okay. you have to make. Let's check that out right let's now. Let's check it out right now. Okay. That's right. It's right. Here let's we check go. it out. It's right. Let's check it out. You do the looking. Here's my eyes. Right. You, sir, have been involved in syndicate gambling, phony bond deals, <laughs> stock market manipulations. <laughs> Look me in the eye. Blackmail. <laughs> making loans with, with prurient interest. Man slaughter. Getting nervous, sir. No, 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 go right ahead. You were involved with man slaughter. Woman slaughter. You were named in a fraternity suit by a Lake Tahoe chorus dancer. In 1971, you were arrested for racketeering, for endangering endangered species, for malfeasance in office with malice of oh, and blatant oh. culprit. That same year, sir, you were fined twenty-seven thousand dollars for skimming funds from a nursing home and a skimming home that you ran. You were, yes, you were
Sergeant Bennett suspected, sir, of income tax evasion, income tax perversion, and drug dealing. Now let's get to the point. What, sir... What is your explanation of all that, sir? Does the man have a right to make a decent living? Is this America, you know, land of the free, home of the brave? Oh, yes, I gave... I am, a pa I am a patriotic man, sir. You are? I gave my life for this country. You did? Many times. Oh, yes, sir. Patriotism, just that's what America's all about, isn't it? Just a moment, it has been said that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. And I, sir, am a patriotic scoundrel. I am not a patriotic scoundrel. Yes, sir, I'll say a picture of them. Four score and seven years ago, I was over there. And yes, I bear my soul to America. They can see that I was... I was dumb. <laughs> Mr. Webster, yes. there is no doubt that you, sir, are an out-and-out -out criminal who is stealing billions of dollars from innocent people. Well, I tell you that, wait a minute! <laughs> I wouldn't do anything rash. There's 75 million people, I tell you again. 75 out? Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think you pulled your head apart, sir. That's mine. <laughs> You know, there's only one thing wrong with the show. It should be a six-hour show. Easy. One hour does not well, make it. We're sitting warmed up here. Yeah, right. <laughs> Shecky. What? You are... <laughs> uh, sorry to intrude on your uh, solitude. You are... Uh, you have a, a unique reputation, even among other comedians, much less your many millions of fans, because in addition to having stock routines, which all of us do and line jokes you repeat, you work very loose. You're one of the great ad-libbers. Uh, do you often develop some of your eventually most effective bits out of an ad-lib point of origin? I think so, yeah. I, I'm not the type of person to consider the typewriter and make up material. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you mentioned earlier, that I worked the lounges in Vegas and everything, and that gave me the opportunity to be free freeform. Loose. Yeah, like right now, I'm very tight. Really? You couldn't tell that. <laughs> no, I couldn't but tell But it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, Bill... The old saying, it, 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 it's a cliché, instead of saying I laughed heartily, you say I fell down, I, I fell on the floor. I literally once fell on the floor laughing at you, as you may or may not recall. You were in one of the lounges in Vegas, this is oh, 20 years ago. Wait, just, uh, you know I'm drowning? <laughs> it's on your, uh, yes, yes, uh, draw, it's, it'll be, yeah, go ahead, tell, tell us. That, that DuPont company lied to me, that should have been dry by this time. <laughs> you were in one of the lounges, and I was sitting at a chair, a table, and they had sort of Swedish curved metal things, and I tipped back laughing at you, fell on the floor, you rushed off, jumped off the floor, off the, the stand, with your mic, and put your hand on my chest. You kept me on the floor for five minutes. I was screaming laughing all that time. <laughs> I bet you don't even remember that. No, but I'd like that to happen again. Nah. <laughs> Just for old time's sake, we have a piano over there, and we sneak your accompanist into the building. Is there anything you would be so moved to... Uh... I, would, I would love to. Ah. Ah. Check your green and ask for them. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce my, my conductor who's been with me now. How many years have you been with me? Oh, about 25, Shaq. 25 years. Yep. You're going to get paid yet. <laughs> this is Herbie Dell and uh, uh, Herbie... <laughs> is that your real name? That's your, just your American name. You have a Hebrew name. I certainly do, Shaq. Tell the people what your Hebrew name is. My Hebrew name is Chaim. Chaim. Yep. What does that mean, Chaim? That means life. That means life. Yep. I got a friend of mine doing Chaim in San Quentin right now. <laughs> He's doing one to Chaim up there. <laughs> you know, that sometimes with an audience, you get a sense of an audience and you feel out the audience, which I'd like to do. I'd like to go out and really feel out this audience. <laughs> and uh, you don't know whether people are going to like jokes or routines or what it is, and, but there's humor all over. Now, R Reagan is going to, to China. And... Oh. Ma a Reagan, yes. Reagan's coming back from China. And the uh, strange thing about it is that the Chinese... Besides, we've seen jugglers and acrobats and everything else. They have a wonderful sense of humor, the Chinese people. I walked into a Chinese restaurant the other day, a place called Afang's, right here in California, in Beverly Hills. And the uh, guy says, oh, you're Saki Green. I see all the time television. You stink. 
As why do you say that? Because you tell different Zoka, you never tell Chinese Zoka. Why you not tell Chinese Zoka? I said, I don't know a Chinese, and he told me a class. And you can tell this to anybody, it's a beautiful story. It's one of the, probably one of the greatest stories I've ever heard in my life, even better than Pia Zadora with the Anne Frank story. <laughs> and um, this is a story about a Chinese father in Hong Kong that said to his son, you don't give man that she's a good. Your mother, as I see, she's a good. I have to drink it out, you don't have to drink it out. You don't have to drink it out, you don't have to drink it out. And his son says, you don't give a good, you don't have to drink it out, you don't have to and the father says, Yun, did you hear this before? What do you, why are you reacting? I'll tell you, since you love that so much, let's do something else. When I was growing up, and we used to go on a Saturday matinee to the uh, movies, they always had these movie musicals. These, uh, uh, well, let me, let me show you. We'll, we'll paint out the scene. I am walking in, in, uh, by an office in Tim Pan Am. Now, Herbie's inside the office, and I'm walking by. I hear the music. I knock on the door. Come in. <laughs> Hi there. How you doing? How are you, Herb? Fine. How what you was that? I, I heard some music coming. Oh, I'm writing a song, a new song. You're writing uh, a new song? Yeah, but I didn't finish it. You didn't finish no, it? No, maybe you could help me on it. I'm very good at this stuff. Maybe I can help you with this. Let me run over this. <laughs> Oh, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. I like the feel of that song, Herb. Uh, thank you, Shaq. Maybe you can help me finish it. I think I could. Or try Let's it. try it. Tear a star from out the sky, and the sky feels blue. Tear a petal from a rose, and the rose weeps too. Take your heart away from mine, and mine will surely break. To take, so please keep the flame away. Would you take the wings? I did that right on the corner, too, I'll tell you that. So that they can't fly. Would you take the ocean's roar and leave just a sigh? All this my heart won't let you do. All oh, this is all I've asked of you. Don't take... Check. What? This, this is where I didn't finish it. We need the ending here. <laughs> what should we do? Yeah. Let's see. Let's try socks. Try that. Sounds good. <laughs> don't take your son. No, no, no one make it. What about pool? Try pool. That's pool, pool. Don't take your pool. No, that won't make it either. <laughs> Her. What? Take a look out that window. Yeah. Do you see that neon sign with the word love in it? Yes, I do. You could see right through that brick building? Yeah. I'm not working with Chaim, I'm working with Clark Kent. <laughs> Don't take the love from the neon sign. The thing I love about your work, Jackie, is it almost doesn't matter what you do. You know, that was a great bit, and you did it brilliantly, but by me, you know what I mean? Sick? You can get up and just Decide do anything for an hour, and I love it. Yeah, but I would like to trade Bill his routine for that routine, if you ah. want to. Oh. <laughs> Bill, you, you write practically all your own material, don't you? I have a steel trap mind, Steve. Mm -hmm. Whatever comes out of someone's trap, I steal, and I hope they don't mind. <laughs> I want that for you, because I know you love work. But isn't My it amazing how comedians always talk, like I noticed that Bill was talking about his mother, you mm -hmm. know, earlier. We, we always talk about the wife or the mother and everything, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because I did a lot of material on my mother. My for mother example. was a, uh, a Jewish lady who was a very poor cook, you know? And I said to my mother one day, I said, Ma, why do you make the chicken so greasy? She said, I never make chicken. I just make a pot of grease. I shape it like chicken. And, <laughs> 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 What's funny about this is my mother actually came to, you know, my mother used to come to see me work all the time in Chicago, Mr. Kelly's. Uh, and uh, she'd say to me, uh, Chicky, Chiky, Chucky, she didn't know my name. <laughs> she says, why do you tell people I talk with an accent? I was born in Chicago. I said, because it's funny that way, Mom. Funny. 
She says, I don't like it. I said, Ma, you know the kind of money I make telling people you talk with an accent? She says, what kind of money? And I told her. She says, listen, I want to tell you one other thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sid, why do you think it is that there isn't much dialect humor anymore? I think people are too sensitive. They really are. They're getting too sensitive about uh, every minority group has a majority now. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you can't... Uh, uh, it, it, people are too sensitive. They're, they, they're losing their sense of humor. Oh, they really we are. don't grow up with it. Absolutely right. You know, the, you know, the generation is... You know, That's right. There's, 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 I never heard it around my house. There is just as much dialect spoken in this country now, but now it's Iranian, it's Bahamian. Yeah. You know, you don't hear so many Jewish dialects, Irish dialects, right. Italian dialects. It's not the same... A foreign immigrant. To well, I think starting now, I couldn't do Haitian. You know, somebody said, you do a Haitian <laughs> dialect, you know? I couldn't. Could you do Haitian? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, man. Yeah. I got to check on that. <laughs> well, you didn't hear Haitian growing up? Seriously? <laughs> no, I really did. Right. Yeah. No, there, no, there were not too many, too, too many Haitians in our, uh, in our neighborhood at that time. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had a neighbor where you walked in, you know, the guy, it, uh, like in any store, was grab a ticket, you know? Like we had a, a delicatessen in our neighborhood, Ashkenaz. And you'd walk in and go, grab a ticket, take a number, you know? <laughs> I was, okay, I'm number one. It's too late for clothes, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out that we are closed for business, too. Uh, we have used up Well, I don't, I don't see why you should do that. Why no. should you do that? Why should you do you that, remember Steve? that one? God love you. It's a wonderful thing to hear you talk. It's the only dialect I do, because I heard it when I was growing up. Did you really? Yes. Where did you hear so it? So it's been a lovely St. Patrick's Day oh, for all of us It's here. nice to be with Mark. Believe me, when I tell you one more game, he would have got a sweater. <laughs> uh, his letter. <laughs> his letter. Not his sweater. His letter. <laughs> hey, we thank our marvelous uh, five funny men. Joe Baker, thank you for joining us. Joe's with us at every one of the shows. Mort Sal, brilliant as always. Thank you so much. Good company. Good company. Yes. yes. Jackie Green, thank you very thank much. Jack, it's always a pleasure. Sid Caesar, the chaplain of television. The chaplain will be holding religious services. And Bill Maher, one of the bright new comedy minds of our time. Thank you all. See you more. Soon on the Comedy Room. Well, I'm going to put up one more thing. I'm going to put up one more thing.